Hi, welcome to Greenville Health System, Department of OBGYN, and our Library of Pearlcast recordings. I'm Dr. Donald Wiper. I'm a gynecologic oncologist, and today I'll be talking with you for a few minutes about cervical disease and neoplasia, and discuss it in terms of its global impact and its impact in the United States. So let's look at cervical cancer and the related collection of HPV-induced precancerous lesions. First of all, cervix cancer is completely dependent on HPV for its development. It is obligate. There are rare cancers that arise in the cervix that are not related to HPV, such as a cervical lymphoma or a cervical neuroendocrine tumor. But for all intents and purposes, when people are talking about the worldwide burden of cervix cancer, we're talking about virtually 100% of those people having an HPV-induced illness. The fact that this cancer and its precancerous lesions are solely caused by this entity has, has created opportunity since most cancers are multifactorial and poorly understood, and this one is the opposite. It's well understood, caused by one etiologic entity, i.e. HPV, that has allowed us to develop highly effective vaccinations, which we'll discuss more in a minute. So why do we care about this? Let's look at this problem by the numbers. 300 million to 1 billion, 50 million, 530,000, 600,000, 300,000. This is the worldwide burden of HPV, and that's the number of sexually transmitted infections of HPV. Therefore, this number would be about one-seventh of the world's population. 50 million are the number of U.S. HPV infections at any one time. 530,000, the number of worldwide cervix cancers caused by HPV. 600,000, the number of worldwide HPV cancers when you include not only cervix, but anal, vulvar, vaginal, pharyngeal, and so forth. 300,000, the number of worldwide deaths due to cervix cancer, which places it as number one or number two killer for women cancer deaths in the world. 80 to 100 percent. 4,000, 12,000. 35,000. Three to five billion dollars. What are these? If you're born after 1950, this is your chance of having been exposed to HPV. There are 4,000 cervix cancer deaths in the United States per year. There are 12,000 cases of cervix cancer. 35,000 USA all types HPV related cancers per year. Three to five billion the cost of HPV related illnesses in the USA per year. A few more numbers. 14 million the number of new HPV infections in the United States each year. 45 the number of countries who state they have vaccinations available against HPV, one country that actually has an effective vaccination program, which is Rwanda. Last number, zero. I've described the burden of HPV and the number of deaths related to cervix cancer in the world, which is staggering. In theory, the number should be zero because this is a preventable cancer. Let's dive into 
HPV a little bit. We said HPV is obligate and necessary to develop cervix cancer and without getting uh, into it in a, in a deep way, the key is that HPV is a virus. It integrates into the host genome in cervical cells and is circular and has multiple open reading frame genes and the two key ones that you need to know about are genes E6 and E7 that make these proteins and these proteins go on to inhibit P53 and to inhibit retinoblastoma both tumor suppressor genes and when you lose their function you develop unregulated growth. Let's talk about pap smears and the development of precancer and cancer. When one gets when a woman gets a pap smear, the result can be unsatisfactory, the result can be normal, the result can be ASCUS or AGC, the result can be low grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. The result can be high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion. Unsatisfactory means you did not have the required cellular elements in the pap smear to state that it was normal. A satisfactory pap smear requires that there's both ecto and endocervical cells, and the pap smear report should contain a statement of, sat of uh, whether it was satisfactory or not. A pap can be normal. PAP can come back as atypical squamous cells of undetermined significance or atypical glandular cells. These are very, very different. If a woman gets an ASCUS pap smear, most labs now do what we call reflexive HPV testing, and that HPV testing is done without you asking, but is a standard protocol in the lab. If the HPV testing is positive, the woman needs colposcopy, which is a magnified look at the cervix, if the reflexive HPV is negative, then that's deemed as being a normal PAP. If a woman has a low-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion PAP smear, colposcopy is required. High-grade squamous intraepithelial lesion colposcopy is required. It should be noted that all of this is cytology, which is difficult. It's the study of free-floating cells, they're out of context, they're not embedded in the tissue from which they came, and it's hard to interpret singular cells. This is in clear distinction from histology, which we'll talk about in a minute. Pap smear guidelines have undergone many changes over the last few years. We are not going to review them here. They're easy to look up. The fundamental principle is that as we've incorporated our knowledge of HPV, and the long-term process by which HPV eventually can result in, in a malignancy. We have changed our guidelines to reflect that, and so the need for pap smears on a yearly or more frequent basis has gone down, and we use our knowledge uh, and ability to test for HPV to focus our attention on those that are more at risk. After a woman has a pap smear, if it's deemed normal, she would follow the guidelines as far as when the next pap smear should be. With respect to an abnormal pap that leads to colposcopy, and then with the possibility of obtaining a cervical biopsy. This, if one ends up with a biopsy, is histology, which results in a plug of tissue that has a basement membrane, it has an external epithelium, it has the deep underlying stroma. Abnormalities of the cells can be at the basilar level. They can occupy more or roughly half to two-thirds or the abnormal cells can be full thickness epithelium all the way to the basement membrane but the basement membrane is intact. In the same setting where there is a breach in the basement membrane with abnormal cells percolating below that then we're dealing with a cancer. And typically around this there would be desmoplasia, lymphocytic infiltrate, other signs histologically that there's a malignancy 
the preservation of the basement membrane with an intraepithelial abnormality is where the term CIN, or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, and these are precancerous. If it's basal portion of it only being abnormal, it's CIN. One half to two thirds of the thickness of the intraepithelial space, CIN. Two full thickness but no breach is CIN3. This nomenclature is analogously used for vulvar intraepithelial neoplasia and vaginal intraepithelial neoplasia. When a biopsy is done, and this is done because the colposcopy shows some evidence of abnormality, we do this by placing acetic acid on the cervix and looking for acetyl-white change. This occurs because of preferential and exaggerated dehydration of cells that have a large nucleus and a relatively small and fragile cytoplasm. We also look for atypical vessels. We look for mosaicism. We look for punctations. These are all hallmarks at the time of colposcopy of potential neoplasia. Using the uh, colposcope magnification, if we do a biopsy, there are several results that are possible. It can be unsatisfactory. It can be a small tangential biopsy that is not a good representative piece of the epithelium, so that may be a result and require you to repeat it. It can be normal, or it can be some degree of CIN, or it can be a cancer. And the CIN, as mentioned previously, can be CIN1, CIN2, and CIN3. There's controversy about whether a cervix cancer can be diagnosed off of a pap smear. In the prior screen, we talked about the difference between histology and cytology. The diagnosis of a cancer requires proof of this breach of the basement membrane. There are many situations where the pap can contain malignant cells, and the pap smear report will come back with some description, such as worrisome for a cancer, highly suspicious for a cancer, but in truth, its absolute diagnosis requires evidence of this breach of the basement membrane. When the biopsy results return with one of these possibilities, we then have options for treatment. In the case of CIN, if it's CIN1, the chance of, of regression to normal is at least 80%. And so it's very advisable not to treat these. If one is a smoker, it would be critical to stop smoking. Smoking seems to be a cofactor for the development and persistence of uh, HPV, CIN, and cervix cancer. In the case of CIN2, the chance of regression is still at least 50% or more, and current recommendations in most patients would be to observe this as well. There can be exceptions where you're dealing with someone at risk for developing a cervix cancer. For example, perhaps a woman in her 40s, smoker, hasn't had a pap smear in many years, finally came in, uh, pap smear and biopsy confirms the presence of CIN2. Uh, there may be uh, a discussion and it may be advisable to treat this uh, given the opportunity that you have uh, to do so. CIN3 does have some rate of regression to uh, a more mild lesion or even back to normal. We don't know what that is because this group has not and likely will not be put into any sort of prospective study with one arm being treated and one arm not being treated. There are plenty of anecdotal uh, stories of patients desiring observation with CIN3 and with regression recurring. I've taken care of multiple patients like that myself. Most patients, however, um, have some sort of intervention here and that typically is some sort of a cone biopsy. And a cone biopsy is called that simply because there's a cone-shaped piece of tissue removed Here's some abnormality, and there's a cone-shaped piece of tissue that's taken out to try to remove this lesion. A cone biopsy can be a cold knife cone done in the operating room with a scalpel. It can be done in the office with an electrical wire, a loop electro-surgical excisional procedure. Uh, historically, uh, people also perform cones with laser. This is not advised and is probably an unnecessary uh, and, and poor uh, choice of uh, use of the laser. Once this uh, uh, excisional procedure is done, the cone biopsy, 
uh, a result is obtained and decisions can be made regarding uh, what to do next. In the case of a malignancy, cervix cancer, the options include surgery versus radiation, typically with sensitizing chemotherapy. The details of this is beyond the scope of this pearl cast, but at a high level, the surgery for cervix cancer includes a radical hysterectomy, which is a specific type of surgery to gain wide margins around the malignancy in the cervix, and then a pelvic lymph node dissection. This is a much more thorough dissection. We would typically call it a lymphadenectomy, trying to remove all lymphoid tissue from the key areas uh, in the pelvis. Radiation chemotherapy typically is reserved for higher stage cancers that are not operable, although it is very effective against lower stage cancers as well. This uh, is the end of the Pearlcast. I hope this has helped set the stage for your understanding of the worldwide burden of HPV and cervix cancer and the approach to pap smears and workup. Thank you very much.